Hello, everybody. Um, I'm hoping you can hear me and that my mic is working. Um, so I'll, I'll um, Claire, thank you for introducing me. And I would just like to say thanks for inviting me to come and do a webinar with you guys today. Um, I will just let you know a little bit about myself and about my background and then we'll crack on and hopefully we'll do some discussion about reflecting and how we can incorporate it into our relationship with the personal tutor. Um, so yeah, as Claire said, I'm, I'm Nicola Clark and I'm actually one of our senior lecturers at Birmingham City University. And I, I have spent probably nigh on 18 years researching and exploring this topic. I am by no means an expert. And I do think that's really important to know that I, I'm probably just a little bit sad and have a very deep seated interest in reflection. Um, I think it's something wonderful. I think it's something amazing that we can engage with, not just for who we are, but our students as well. Um, I also think it's an incredibly misunderstood term. Um, so it, that is something that I would like to kind of explore today is to make sure that we're kind of singing from the same hymn sheet and that we all sort of understand reflection in the right way. Um, I do want to explore how we can obviously apply it to the personal tutor relationship. And I, I am attempting to do today, if we get a chance, I'm going to try and demonstrate guided discovery or um, reflective dialogue. So if nobody else will be a willing volunteer, Claire has very kindly offered, well, actually I told her she would be, she would be my volunteer so I can actually show some of this, um, how not to do it and maybe how to do it. Um, I'm assuming you guys have got some experiences already on reflection. Um, I'm also a mental health nurse by background, sorry I forgot to tell you that, and I did my doctorate in teaching and learning concepts and I explored um, reflection and how it was taught. Um, I'm also the author of the Student Nurse's Guide to Successful Reflection, 10 Essential Ingredients. It's, it's a nice easy book, most people will read it in a couple of nights, you'll hear my lovely dulcet tones coming through the book. Um, and my claim to fame is probably the most stolen book out of our library at the minute, so you know, uh, it's there, it's useful. Um, so um, I would say I am going to ask you to chat with me as we're going through, not just to sort of chat at the end. Um, and if you've got any questions, please feel free to chuck it in the chat bar and hopefully I'll pick it up. Um, I need to move my now, just move my mic apparently. Right, hopefully you can hear that now. Um, so please feel free to um, put anything in the chat bar, any questions you've got in the chat bar. But, you know, if you've got a question, and you want to turn your mic on and ask me, I am more than happy to, for you to do that as well, because I am going to be asking you guys some questions as we're kind of going through. So before I go on to my first slide, which will kind of give the game away. Um, can I ask, is anybody willing to tell me um, what their experiences of that term reflection are so far? Have you guys got any experiences of reflection and really? You got any understanding of it? What's, what's your positionality at the minute? What's your narrative? What's your understanding of reflection so far? Does anybody fancy talking to me and uh, letting me and telling me about your experiences? Andrew, hi. Hello there. Can you hear me okay? I can. Can you hear me? Because apparently my mic wasn't in quite the right place. I'm hoping you can <laughs> yeah. hear me. <laughs> yeah, so you sound great. I can hear you. Thank you. Hi, Andrew. Um. So I work at the University of Glasgow um, as a student advisor and right. often what I'll find is because I'm a frontline service employee, um, a great deal of my time will be reflection. Yes. Um, what I noticed upon reflection from then off is I don't actually use any sort of model. Um, my own reflection is not like embedded in any sort of theory. Um, and I guess something else is it's very... Um, centric to me so I'll often always start things with like I could have done this better so I guess it's also quite harsh rather than you know positive and constructive okay um one more thing I would say about reflection as well I'm bad for writing things down and never looking at it again <laughs> so it, it's almost as though you know what, what kind of fruit am I getting from my reflection but uh yeah I just um thought I would kind of share that Oh, do you know what? Well, first and foremost, thank you for responding to me and talking to me and being the, the brave one who's going to go first. But I, I, I really appreciate that because actually you've highlighted some really important points. Actually, there's something that's coming up in the chat bar as well, that um, it is, um, it's very self-orientated reflection. It's supposed to be about you. You know, you can't reflect about anybody else. You can reflect about um, 
what you think other people think of you and how they respond to you and you can reflect on how you're responding to them but it is it is you know you can't speak for the people so it is very self-orientated um it shouldn't be too critical and that's something i wanted to explore today because um in nursing um we've got a terrible habit of only telling our students to reflect on bad stuff you know you must go and reflect on a critical incident um and we we completely negate to tell them that actually do you know what you you can learn from any experience you have it doesn't have to be a bad one um so so i'm hoping by the end of this you might stop being so hard on yourself maybe <laughs> stop being too critical um because also you know it, it, it's very subjective as well so you know and sometimes in order for us to feel good about ourselves we tend to be quite critical about ourselves as well and so if we're engaging with reflection fully we're trying to bring the objective into the subjective process so hopefully you know when we explore a little bit more maybe you'll stop being so critical and you said something else which is really important yes models so um we're probably not gonna we might not have time to go into that today but again i you know i i, I spend my life probably teaching staff and students that um models of reflection reflective models reflective cycles reflective frameworks um, they're all lovely jubbly but they all do the same thing they drive a car from a to b they drive you through the reflective process so if you understand the reflective process if we know what reflection is um we don't always need to use one i don't always need a car to get from a to b i might choose to walk and that's my choice to do that. Um, and I think so reflective models, um, they do have their purpose. Um, and especially for our students who some of them are quite novice reflectors and don't really understand how to move themselves through the process. So um, utilization of a model such as Gibbs's, um, you know, Borton's or Driscoll's version of Borton's or Rolf and Jasper's version of Driscoll's, which is Driscoll's version of Borton's, you know, you know, this is what we do in academia, you know, that they can be very useful. But I do think for us, um, as, as people trying to support students to reflect, a student will not reflect properly just using a model because the model doesn't tell them what reflection is. It doesn't help them to understand it. It doesn't help them to know the underpinning theory of it to know what it is why it's important why we do it and then we use the model it's a bit like be trying to tell somebody to get into a car and just drive the car without teaching them about the car if that makes sense and expect them to get in it and drive it so i notice with our students a lot of the times you know if we get them to write reflectively which some of you are saying that you've done in, in some of your you know your own previous training if we get them to write reflectively um it's not uncommon or, or to present a reflective presentation it's not uncommon for them to actually not engage in reflection at all but still use the model because actually we haven't taught them what reflection is so um in relation to reflecting to get our students to reflect they have to understand what it is first um so I, I do think that's really important and i don't think the use of a model is necessarily a must um, and I say that quite controversially. I've just come a quick look at the chat because I don't want to just make sure that I've missed out anything. Um, it's difficult. Oh, yes. So someone says it's difficult. Um, do you know? And it, it's interesting as well because I remember in our first year of our, our one of our nursing programs, years and years and years ago, we managed to get it changed. We used to ask the students to write a reflective essay. So they would be coming into academia. They didn't know what reflection was. Most of them haven't written at degree level or level four, and we're expecting them to do the two hardest things, which is write at degree level and well, while you're at it, reflect while you're writing. So reflection's really difficult. The premise of it, I think the conceptual understanding of it is quite simple, but actually doing it and how to do it is not easy. And then writing reflectively, I think is actually incredibly difficult, um, especially writing reflectively for academic purpose because we expect all of the nuances of academic writing plus drawing upon the literature plus that reflection in there. So I think we have a job and I suppose that's when we think about then as a personal tutor, if we can practice the art of supporting reflective dialogue within our students, the more we can kind of immerse our students, I'm just gonna move on to the next slide, within the reflective process and 
help them to experience reflection by being on the receiving end of reflective discussion. So as a, as a personal tutor, we um, um, support them to reflect on their experiences. The greater level their understanding of reflection will be so that when they're having to reflect themselves either in an essay or for you know um if if we want them to become those effective reflective practitioners they'll be much better at it so I, I do think it has a really big role as a personal tutor the things i'm putting up on the screen by the way i'm not actually going to read that out to you um this is just an extended description of reflection and this actually came out of my research done with, that's why it's extended, probably because I waffle, but um, it came out of my research with my students um, and the academic staff. Um, and we really tried to explore what the meaning of reflection was. Um, and so what I, what I wanted to do was just have a quick look at this chat and make sure I've not missed anything. Um, we increased re students reflect on their learning. Yes. Um, so Wendy says it's to uncover our, oh, is to uncover our hidden selves and notice. Wendy, are you around to put your mic on? Sorry, do you mind if I talk to you a second? Because I love yeah, it. No, that's fine. Oh, I love that. It's giving me goosebumps. I feel that it uncover our hidden selves and notice bias, prejudice. I absolutely love this. Can you? Can you? <laughs> sorry, I'm getting so excited because it's not uncommon. You may notice yourself. It's not uncommon for people to have a very sort of um, different understanding and potentially sometimes incorrect understanding of reflection. And I absolutely love this. So would you like to expand on that a bit? Okay. Well, I just um, so I first came across reflection when I did a degree as a mature student and um, I really struggled with it until my third year. And then I just sort of suddenly started to learn things about myself once I got better at reflecting using a model because I, I really didn't know where else to start. And I just started to look at the theory of it and think, do you know what, this is what it's all about for me, isn't it? It's about why did I respond to that pupil like that? Why did that make me angry? And I just suddenly thought maybe that's what reflective practice is all about. I absolutely, I, 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 I so love what you're saying because I think you've encapsulated um, what reflection actually is. And I, I can't tell, I mean, I, I, teach, I teach reflection across levels four, five, six, seven, and eight across nearly every program in our faculty and to postgrad students, undergraduate students, to staff. And it always makes me a little sad when I hear, when I ask people, what do they think reflection is? And I'll often say, okay, so it's looking back and looking at what I did well and what I didn't do so well. And, and then I must, what I can do to improve. And I'm like, oh, oh gosh. Um, and it always makes me a little sad because I think oh, it's so much more than that um, and so much more purposeful than that. And not that evaluation of our practice is not important, um, you know, especially, you know, you know, even in any field, you know, um, looking back and actually exploring the mechanics of what you did and whether you didn't do it very well, we definitely need to improve. You know, that is absolutely important, but we need to stop calling it reflection because it's not. Um, reflection is actually quite a little bit more complicated than that so actually you highlighting for me that it's about uncovering the why it's about uncovering who you are and it's about helping you to develop a, a much deeper level of understanding of what constitutes I and like say why you react in that way why you did that in that way I just it, it's really lovely to hear that when did you, I'm just going to use you as an example if that's okay um I, yeah. I, I just want to show the example that I often show to our students because I think it helps sometimes to understand actually what you've just said Wendy um you know I'll often say to students so if, if you just imagined you're all sort of nursing students because oh, I'm a nurse sorry so I'm, I'm, I'm not sure what all of your backgrounds are and, and imagine Wendy sorry I'm going to pick on you imagine Wendy mm -hmm. is a nursing mentor and when did you just for the second you're going to be a terrible terrible mentor and I'm assuming you're amazing whatever you do but just imagine right now that you're a bit rubbish and uh, Wendy's not a very good nurse not a very good mentor and she's sitting in the nurse's station and you know she's got her feet up and she's thinking you know what I'm going to chill I've got Nicola coming in today she's a student I'm doing nothing I'm going to make her do all the work um, and so imagine just for a second, and it's probably hard to believe, but imagine just for a second that I'm about 18 and, you know, I've never stepped foot in a hospital. I know nothing about anything. I'm really just first day, first day ever stepping foot in a hospital. And Wendy says, oh, Nick, get over here. So I, I pops on over to Wendy and I introduce myself and she says, right, I want you to go over to Andrew and I want you to give, imagine that's an injection. I want you to give that injection into Andrew's arm. Uh, okay. 
and I tootle on over and I can see Keith here. So I'm, I'm just going to use Keith. So I'm tootle on over to Keith and I give the injection to Keith's leg. So if we then just do what often students think they need to do, which is look back at what went well and what didn't go so well, you know, anybody with half brain can kind of work out that not an awful lot went very well there. You know, I've basically done a little bit of damage to two people in the space of half an hour on placement. Um, so, you know, I've got gaps in my knowledge. I put it in the wrong body part. I put it in the wrong person. Um, so, you know, I need to go away. I need to fill the gaps in my knowledge. I need to, you know, read some physiology. I need to do my nurse training. So one of the things I often then ask of my students is, if I do that, if I fill those gaps in my knowledge, um, if I really think, okay, what did I do well, what I didn't do so well, and improve my practice, do you think in the future, where I have similar thoughts and feelings, do you think I would make a similar error again? So, so kind of what do you think our students would say to that? So I think they'd say, no, they wouldn't make future mistakes. Absolutely. That's the first thing to say. No, nope, no, I'm fine now. I know what I've done. And I'm like, mm, okay, right. Okay, let's take it a step back. Do we know what the original error was first? And the students will go, no, no, no. And I'll say, so actually the original error was me saying yes to the person, to you, Wendy, sorry. <laughs> my original error was actually feeling the need to say yes to you and if we just look back at what we did well and what we didn't do so well do I know why I said yes to Wendy and they start to realize actually no we don't know why so in the future if I come across another experience that actually has generates similar thinking in me and generates similar feelings within me, at which point the reason I said yes to Wendy might be because I was eager to please, I might have been anxious, I might have been worried that she wouldn't sign me off at the end of placement, I might have felt a power imbalance. There could be numerous reasons as to why I felt the need at that point in time to say yes. If I don't uncover that, if I don't explore the why of that experience, in the future where I should potentially say no, I am potentially going to say yes again. And so I think reflection is so, it's so important for our students to understand that actually what we're trying to do, I always say to our students, imagine you're kind of on a lilo and you're floating around in the sea and that's your experience, okay? You're trying to dive off that lilo. You're trying to sort of dive off in the scene, uncover what is going on underneath here to have made that experience happen and I've noticed that Emily you just said you're coming across a lot of cases where students been told they must reflect in the third person Ooh, this is not right at all is it you know um in the third person how can you reflect if you're reflecting in the third person because reflection's about me it's about who I am it's about what I've experienced and what I've been through um so yes my tip for that is um and um I I, I try and do it really nicely is I will often email the person who's put the module descriptive together and the module assignment brief and say, if you're asking somebody to reflect in the third person, this is not a reflective essay. This is either just a critical evaluation or it's an exploration of a case study, but it's not reflective. Um, and then we need to then start to explore people's understanding of reflection. So, you know, trying to help our students recognize some of the things that are in this description here, which is you know, helping them to connect with reflection in a much more meaningful way, helping them to understand that actually the use of I, the absolute focus on why I thought something or what I thought and what I felt at that time is of paramount importance. Um, so why, why do you think I would say that? Why do you think I would say, and for anybody who's done some counselling background, you will, you will hopefully agree with me um why you think focusing on the eye and the feelings and the thinking is absolutely what differentiates reflection away from just a critical evaluation or an evaluation of, of our practice it starts to give you accountability on different things that yeah. you know i'm i'm feeling this i'm linking in with it and therefore i've then got a responsibility to do something about it rather than a, a step away perhaps with the third person yes absolutely so what it does is is at that point in time 
it allows us to take that accountability. It allows us to start to take some ownership of, of what we think and feel. And actually then the implications of that for that experience. So yes, thank you. Um, Andrew, you've got your hand up, sorry. Sorry, I just wanted to add to what Nina was saying because that's a really good point, but I think you could also see emotion as being a condition of being logical and rational. And often what I'll find is people will try to ignore or suppress the emotion and therefore never get to that. It's like an anchoring bias. There are, you know, emotions not good. I always kind of feel as though um, something bad happens from this. Therefore, I'm never going to explore it. So yep. almost put a boundary up there like immediately. Yes. And, and you have actually, again, you've highlighted something that's also really important, especially if we're going to actually facilitate reflection within our personal students. Um, it's interesting. Now, I'm, I'm so glad you've sort of said that in relation to what Nina said, because um, in, in the book that I wrote, the, one of the things that our students and staff came up with when we looked at what the 10 essential ingredients were, actually, some of those were related to your attitude towards reflection, which is actually being quite brave. It's not easy to reflect. It's not easy to ask yourself what you've what you feel about something it's actually really quite difficult um it's not easy to be honest about what you think about something you know I'll say to students how you know how many times have you actually told yourself you mustn't think that way you know I've got three ex-mother-in-laws now I can be really honest about what I think about. <laughs> um sorry my humor's quite dark but um you know back then I would be kind of telling myself what I was supposed to think and feel about these people you know based upon society's expectations and you know the ex-husband's expectations of what you should think and feel about your mother-in-law but anyway the point is 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 it's nerve-wracking it's difficult especially if you're reflecting on a difficult experience or an experience where um, there's a perceived level of any level of trauma or anxiety or upsetness about it. Engaging with what you think and feel is really hard, but it's an absolute must because in order to alter behavior, you have to understand what you think and feel because your thoughts and your feelings drive your behavior. You know, if you've got students who are bored in class, it's because they're thinking and feeling bored, so they'll behave bored. Um, so if you've got students excited in class and engaging, it's because they're thinking and feeling in that way. So they'll behave in that way. So for, for us, it's for me, it's getting our students to, it's giving them permission um, to actually allow the student to connect with I. Um, and we don't often do that. And we certainly negate to do that in academia, I think, because I don't know about you guys, but I know in our faculty, they'll often say things, like, oh, use of, use of I is less academic. And it's like, well, why is it? You know, just because I'm using I and writing reflectively doesn't mean to say it has to be less academic, doesn't mean to say I'm not positioning my experience within the literature, doesn't mean to say I'm not exploring what's occurring. It doesn't make it, what makes it less academic is slang, colloquialism, bad grammar. You know, so um, it's, it's about giving students permission to use I and, and also giving our staff, you know, permission to say, you know what, it's OK for us to allow our students to talk about themselves. And in, and in saying what, we, what you've just said, Andrew, about, you know, the, the anxiety sometimes around engaging with emotion. Um, it's also very self-caring. Um, we, we did a little piece for the Nursing Times not so long ago that actually looked at reflection as being very self-caring because, you know, we often think of self-care as, you know, well, I do, you know, you're having a glass of wine, you know, deserve a glass of wine tonight or, you know, it, it, I lift weights, so you're going out and do some weightlifting, that's self-care to me or eating health or whatever. Um, but actually taking time out to allow yourself to, um, the time to truly engage with what you think and feel is self-care. Um, it's important. Um, and I was discussing with a colleague not so long ago that um, when we ask people to write reflectively, and I think something that we can take into our relationships with our personal tutor into that sort of engagement with them is, is allowing our students to tell their story, to tell their narrative, to tell their provenance, you know. Um, we don't often allow them to do it. You know, I've, I've been an external examiner for 19 years and I'll often see um, sort of essays, reflective essays where, you know, you've got a thousand words and you're giving them like, a, you, must, you must follow Gibbs's model. I've actually seen Gibbs's model be tried to be followed in 500 words, which is, I think is tantamount to impossible almost really, considering the six stages. 
but you know we're giving them a couple of hundred words to actually say what their story was or to actually lay down their experience but actually the art of the the analysis the criticality that needs to come into reflection in order to generate that learning um is very difficult to do if you don't know what your narrative is, if you don't explore your experience. So I think something that we can certainly do within that sort of personal tutor relationship is absolutely allow our students to tell us their narrative. We can allow them to validate themselves. And I do think that's really important. Um, and I'm not saying that reflection always has to be incredibly meaningful. You know, we, you know, we don't need to, um, um, get them to you know it's reflection is not counseling and I do think that's really it, it steals a lot of elements um and it utilizes at a different level lots of the sort of techniques and the skills um but it, and it, it might highlight a need for somebody to go in and process this in a more structured way in a different way um but it is important that we allow our students to tell the narrative and it's important that we recognize that any experience can be reflected on. You know, I'm having an experience with you guys now doing my first webinar ever. That's an experience for me that I could actually learn something about myself if I chose to reflect on it. Um, and I think moving away for us from the sort of the use of sort of critical incident analysis or you must reflect on an event, um, for me, helps the students to understand that, you know, do you know what, you can actually reflect on absolutely any experience you've ever had in your entire life. Sorry, Emma says, would students have the chance to reflect on experiences? Um, maps of world. Yes, these maps of the world. And that's really important. And we can learn to read their maps of the world. Yeah, you know, we, it, it is really important to recognise that they're coming, we're coming from different positions. And you know, um, that empathic regard, that trying to understand somebody from their own unique perspective, it's not actually that easy to do because um, to really understand somebody, you've got to ask them questions about what they're experiencing. And you've got to allow them the time to elaborate. Um, and yes, you're right. We want to learn to read our students' maps and we, we want them to tell them our maps. Does that make sense? Um, so, you know, uh, sorry, if I'm missing any questions, please feel free to sort of put your mic up or put your hand up and, and, and ask me as we're going along. So, so the other thing I just wanted to draw our attention to is we know that reflection is about an exploration of experience. We've got all these wonderful theories out there like Shearn, who will say it's on experience, in experience. We can also pre-reflect. We can also explore what we think and feel about something before we even get into an experience to explore the potentiality of an experience. Um, but for me, I always said to our students, it's really important that the, the process of reflection absolutely does not assume you've done something wrong. It does not assume you need to improve. And I do think that's important because, um, you know, I think Andrew mentioned it earlier, you know, engaging with reflection is not easy. And developing somebody's confidence in their ability to reflect needs to come from us, I think, advocating for the fact that, like I said, you don't have to keep choosing really bad things to reflect on. Um, it doesn't assume, you're not gonna reflect to, to look at, you know, how bad a person you are and how much you need to improve. Um, it's really not about that. Reflection is, it, it works from a very neutral premise. The only assumption it makes is that you wish to understand yourself to a greater level. You wish to gain a heightened, level of self-awareness you wish to learn more about yourself in the context of experience and in the context of how others experience you and how you affect and also react to those you know i mean i i, I just think it's such an important thing that we can sort of all get to grips with and, and certainly support our students in becoming you know sort of that effective reflective practitioner um and we've really talked we've talked a little bit about sort of the purpose of it and I love this sort of second to the last one where um, Boyd and Fells talked about critical reflection being the core difference between whether a person repeats the same experience many times getting really good at that one behavior or whether we can learn from our experiences enough that I could potentially be cognitively and effectively and therefore transformationally changed you know I, I say I, I, you know I'll often say you know knowledge is power I don't want power over anybody else, by the way. I've got no intention of trying to have power over anybody else, but I want power over myself. I want to be able to inform my future experiences. I want to be 
I want to be the best version of me, not the best version of me against anybody else. I just want to know myself well enough that I can be the best version I can of me. And I think engaging with that reflective process whereby we can really kind of, you know, immerse ourselves within experiences where we can kind of really start to analyze and explore those where we can draw conclusions from that that we can then use I think is a, is a, is a really good thing for us to be able to do has anybody got any questions so far anything they completely disagree with because obviously that's that's perfectly all right too um no and if, like I said I, I apologize if I've missed anything in the chat bar I don't know when any of you know about Barbara Basso because this is also something we can perhaps work, use, utilize with our students and show our students. She created the metaphorical mirror, and and I love. I actually, it's quite small. Sorry, but um, I, I've just, I only wanted to show you a couple of these, but I love. I absolutely love these mirrors, um, and I love the way she utilized the different types of mirrors to show the different angles from reflecting as what it can highlight for us. So, for example, this bathroom mirror when you kind of look at yourself in a way. So, you know, before I did this webinar, I kind of looked in the bathroom mirror um, and I thought, yeah, not looking so great. Need to shove something on because that's not what I want you lot to see. <laughs> so the bathroom mirror reflects immediately back at you, the perception or the, not the perception, sorry. The, yeah, the, um, the image that the world has of you. And I, I remember being, when I was a student, um, I was quite vocal as a student. Um, and I remember um, I was always one of those students who, if you know, if you have to do group work, you know, I'm always the one who'll open my gob, you know, I'm always the one who open my mouth and I always stand up and do something. I, I just, I can't help myself. Um, and I remember um, I was working with this group once, there's a bunch of mental health nurses. Mental health nurses, my day, we sometimes were a bit, we were a bit lazy. <laughs> we were always late to class. We used to fall asleep in class. We weren't the best students. And I remember just trying to get this thing done. And this student, this other, my colleague immediately said to me, well, you're a bossy wench, aren't you? And I'm like, is that, is that how people see me, bossy? Is that what I'm literally oozing out to the world? And I thought, oh my goodness. And I hadn't seen that in myself at all. I hadn't perceived myself as being bossy. And I thought, you know what, I need to sort this out because I don't want to be bossy. I don't want people to experience me as a really bossy person. Actually, at times I can be quite anxious. And I'm because I'm quite compassionate towards others, if a lecturer in our class was trying to get us to do something, if my colleagues were sitting there looking like they were sleeping, I, I would really feel for the lecturer. I'd be thinking, that must feel awful. So I would always be the person to open my mouth, not because I wanted to show off, but because I felt for them. But actually in doing so, the way that I was presenting myself to the world was actually, it got thrown back at me in the, in the bathroom mirror, was I was bossy. And I'm like, ooh, you know, I need to explore this and I need to, it's not how I want. I understand what I'm doing, but I need to actually try and look at other ways that I can actually express myself. So the bathroom mirror, I think, is really helpful. And then I love this, the kind of rear view mirror. You know, we talk to students, I talk to students about when we're reflecting on our practice. And then I know Sean calls it reflection on action. And again, I think action kind of is quite a reductionist view of what reflection can actually mean. We can reflect on experience to me. I much prefer the word experience. Um, when we reflect on action or on our experiences, you know, our experiences can inform how we move forward. So if you're driving down the road and you're driving in your car, if you're on a motorway, if you don't look in your rear view mirror to look at what's coming up behind you and you happen to be driving, you know, maybe a little Skoda Yeti and all of a sudden up behind you is coming a Range Rover, you know, nothing wrong with a Skoda Yeti, but it's not quite as fast as a Range Rover. If you don't see that, your future might not be what you want it to be because you're pulling out and you're moving forward without actually looking at what's occurred behind you in order to inform how you move forward. So. I'll often say to our students, you know, that rear view mirror, looking back, exploring those experiences is what's going to enable us to actually move forward with information. Um, and I think that's something that we can do quite a lot of in our personal tutor relationships is get them to explore the experiences that they've had so that they can move forward in their course, in their profession, whatever you guys, whatever work you do with your students, they can move forward with information about themselves, which is quite powerful. Um, and they can also move forward in understanding how they affect people. Um, and I, you know, I think one of the things that I do say a lot to our students is 
yes, is, you know, you absolutely, you know, you must understand part of reflection isn't just self-indulgent thinking. We don't just think. Thinking sends you into my care. Um, thinking purposefully, analytically and critically and exploring something and then doing something with the information is reflection. But I'll, you know, I'll often say to our students, it's not self-indulgent. It's not just ruminating because that can be unhealthy. Um, we do want to understand how we affect others because actually that can actually enhance our relationships with others. You know, I, I often give them the, the, the I, I was a really terrible student um, and not because I was disinterested. I just, I thought I would joined, I actually thought I'd applied to do a psychology degree and I hadn't, um, I didn't want to leave home. I wanted to go and work in Tesco to be perfectly honest forever. Um, and so I sort of went away from home at the, you know, that you must leave home and go and do your degree because that's what you do. And so I just applied for anything thinking I'd done psychology. So when I enrolled, I was running on to a mental health nursing course. I'm like, oh dear, better carry on. Now I'm down here. <laughs> we'll crack on. Um, so, you know, I wasn't the best mental health nurse to start off with. I was a bit rubbish. And when I then gave my first injection, I was even more rubbish because I had an absolute inherent irrational fear of hurting somebody because people who hurt people aren't very nice, are they? And I didn't want to hurt anybody. Um, and when I gave my first injection, it actually took me three goes, three goes to get a blinking needle in this person, because we were taught to give injections in oranges. And for anybody who's non-nursing out there, orange skin is nothing like people's skin. So it bounces, you know, it goes in easily, but it bounces off people's skin. You've got to get a little more force. So after it bounced off the second time of this poor gentleman, bearing in mind this gentleman was in his 80s, and I'm trying to, you know, I'm like 19, shaking like leaf, sweating, looking just awful, looking like I'm about to pass out. You know, it bounced off a second time, and I could feel myself trying not to cry. And if you've ever, have you ever tried to swallow a cry, and it hurts. <laughs> and I could just feel, and this like single tear was like dropping out of my eyes, and I'm thinking, you absolute plonker, you're, just, you're, you're making such a fool of yourself. So the old gentleman, the gentleman, he actually sat up and he grabbed my hand and he said to me, Nicola, he said, I have been through a war. He said, and I've got shrapnel where shrapnel does not belong. You're not going to hurt me. Just get it in there. <laughs> so I put it in and I went away and I did diligently reflected on my experience. You know, I explored my thoughts, my feelings. I did my research on anxiety and how it affected my thinking. I did loads of stuff, but I never actually stopped to ask myself how did the gentleman experience me? Because he did experience me. He experienced me to such a degree that he made me feel better. He felt the need to sit up and on his very poorly bed and make the nurse who's supposed to be making him feel better, feel better. And so, you know, I, I, I do, I'm very mindful. And I think this is something we can do within our personal tutor work to be very mindful of actually asking our students questions about perspective, how other people see them how they think people responded to them because in any profession um you know understanding ourselves in the context of others and how people respond to us is really important you know and, and it can actually enhance our interpersonal connections with people so for you guys as well you know it's important that we reflect that we that we embody what it is we want our students to be um you know so if our students aren't responding to us very well i think it goes back to actually what wendy said earlier if our students aren't responding to us in the way that we want them to let's not look at what the students doing let's look at what we're doing and and, and maybe why explore that in our own reflective practice so i do like barbara bassett's moves i think it's a nice way of seeing the different mirrors that can actually help us reflect in different ways so if we apply some of this to personal tutoring um you know, we're looking at, you'll all be doing different things, I imagine, within your sort of um, personal tutoring um, into in, in relationships, connections with your students. Um, but if we're then thinking about, for me, what I'm, I suppose, what I wanted to try and do today with you is was, was to get us to think about actually getting our students to reflect so that we can support some guided reflection within them so that they can start to reflect on their experiences of being at university, of being away from home, of being part of their course, or, you know, if, if it's a clinical course of connecting with their patients or if it's an education course of connecting, you know, in, in any sense, shape or form, getting them to, 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 to explore that. So when we think about the, um, the conversation that we have we will range between all of these so being very non-directive with our students to listening to literally just listening to understand somebody just to be there and 
demonstrate I'm actually here and I'm here to listen to you uh, right through to actually we might need to give some instruction and actually tell a student what to do especially if they don't know what to do so there's a range of where we're at with our personal tutoring um, but for me the reflective dialogue the reflective element um, kind of sits more at the non-directive end so the top bit here listening to understand reflecting paraphrasing what the student's saying, asking open questions, clarifying assumptions, helping them to summarize, asking questions that way, raise awareness, giving them some feedback. This is kind of where we're going to be in that reflective conversation. If we start to think about making suggestions, giving guidance, there's nothing wrong with that, obviously, because I think as a personal tutor, you know, we are there to give guidance. I know on many occasions I've, I've had to give my students guidance, but I think the nurse in me um, sometimes has a habit of just wanting to fix something immediately because <laughs> I just want somebody to feel better about something. Um, and, you know, that's not always the best way at times. Sometimes it's, it's, it's good to allow um, somebody to explore the thing for themselves, that they can draw their own conclusions and come up with their own ideas. But there is going to be times when we do need to offer guidance where we do need to fix something. But that doesn't mean to say we can't facilitate reflection within the student first and then help them to kind of draw those conclusions. So have you all have you all heard of kind of Socratic dialogue? Does anybody know what this is? I'm assuming there's probably quite a few of you that do know what it is. No, Emma says no, no. Andrew does, yeah, yeah. Okay, so some people know, some people yes. Yeah. So, so um, in really simple terms, because I do like to put things quite simply, um, this is based upon. As a nurse, I can. Oh, yeah, what did I'm just going to look like? What uh, Sam says. As a nurse, I can relate to when to fix. I you know, I know, I'm terrible. Just, <laughs> it's just and and actually pushing ourselves out of our comfort zone to not fix things is is actually really important. So, Socratic dialogue is a way of asking questions that it's quite probing. And it can generate a greater level of, uh, of information about something that can then generate a deeper level of understanding. There are human beings in this world. Oh, yes, Larissa, remind me to do that then, sorry. There are human beings, <laughs> Socratic, sorry, in this world that are amazing at Socratic questioning and they don't even know they're doing it. Can you guess who? What human being in this world is amazing, do you think, at Socratic questioning? So open probing questions. Anybody got kids? Yeah, yeah. They're amazing at it. They are utterly, utterly, your cousin. <laughs> yeah, they're utterly, utterly amazing. Because kids ask the one question a lot of why, but why, but why? Now, when my daughter was five, if I'm holding a conversation with her, absolutely, if I'm holding a conversation with her and she says, mummy, can I do this? And I say, no. And she'll say, why? And I'll say, because mummy says so. Then a descriptive answer with no kind of discussion will, will suffice. Um, however, now that she's 16, that doesn't suffice anymore. She'll question me. But why? What's that got to do with that? Well, how does that correlate to that? Well, what would be the implications, mum, of me doing that against that? She's actually, in effect, making me analyse and reflect on my decision to say no. If I then can't come up with a half-decent answer, why am I saying no? I need to reflect on why am I actually saying no to it. So the why question, the what question, the however questions, these are simple questions that actually are classed as Socratic questions that open up um a dialogue to be had a conversation to be had why do you think that where do you think that came from why do you think that occurred in that way what made you feel that where do you think that feeling came from how do you think that feeling influenced the way you then acted in that sense so those why questions the what questions sort of however questions those questions are open probing questions that allow for a deeper level of exploration and in Socratic dialogue, there is like sort of six distinct types. We've got questions for clarification. Don't be catching it. 
<laughs> Good. I love that question. I love that. <laughs> so we've got questions for clarification. We've got questions that will produce assumptions. So are you telling me that what you mean by that is actually that? Clarifications, have I understood that correctly? Is this what you mean? Do you mean that? Um, questions which necessitate reason or evidence. So, you know, why do you think that? Where do you think that's come from? Um, you know, it, uh, do you think that way because that's how somebody responded to you? Oh, yes, George and Peppa Pig was amazing. Um, we saw them live, by the way, it was a bit weird. Um, questions regarding perspectives. So how do you think that other person felt when you said that to them? Um, how do you think they experienced you? So it gives people different perspectives. Questions which calculate consequence. So what are the implications of that, do you think? Um, and questions on the question. So these types of question are what go into um, supporting a student to reflect. Um, but it, it can be a little dodgy. And I was, so I was just wondering if, if, if anybody would perchance or perhaps be brave enough to let me demonstrate this on somebody. Claire, it might have to be you if nobody's brave enough to let me show anybody. Oh, Andrew, well done. Go on, Andrew, shove your mic on. Right, so Andrew's been really brave. Thank you so much, Andrew. Well. <laughs> um, I owe you beer later. <laughs> Andrew's been really brave. So all I'm going to do on Andrew, um, if it's okay, I, I, I'm just, would it be all right, Andrew, if I asked you about your experience of the pandemic? Yeah, yes, Do you feel comfortable talking about that? Okay, so I'm going to ask Andrew about his experience of the pandemic. So what I'm going to do to start off with, and I just want you to listen and see what you think, is I'm going to just try to employ just some Socratic questioning. Um, Andrew, you might feel a certain way to this, and, and that's okay. Um, so, Andrew, it's lovely to meet you virtually. Thank you so much for offering to do this for me. So what was your experience of this whole pandemic like? My experience um, was probably twofold. Um, there was parts where I absolutely hated it um, on a personal and a social level. Why? On a, well, I'd probably say because there was a lack of conversation face to face with people. Okay, so why was there no face to face? Because there was a contagious disease. Um, so how does that uh, impact on you? It was probably impactful because I'm a very social person and need that stimulation. Why do you need stimulation? Do you want a time out? <laughs> no, no, this is, no, I've had this done to me before. <laughs> um, probably because I, I realised during the pandemic I'm actually an ambivert, so I like time to myself and also time with other people. Okay. So we will time out there a minute. So uh, I'm assuming you heard a lot of what, a lot of why questions. Yes. Right. So first and foremost, before I ask everybody else, how did that feel? Um, so, so the first time I had it done to me felt interrogative. Um, yeah. the, just now I was kind of more prepared. So it was also quite difficult to continue delving yeah. deeper into the why. Yes. So if you hadn't had that done before, as people have quite noticed in the chat, it's horrible, <laughs> unnatural, it's yeah. quite stressful, it's like an inquisition, it does not feel nice. It probably didn't sound very nice to everybody else. Um, and like you say, you also get to a point where you think, I'm struggling to know what to actually answer here. So, so if you just stay on, yes, intimidating, absolutely. So that so if we're going to try and engage yes our students our personal students in any level of reflective dialogue please do not not do that <laughs> i have heard people do that it's not pleasant it doesn't feel nice and it's actually quite aggressive so for those of you who've done this kind of stuff before you know we've got to have some communication skills. Um, and the reason I say this is because, you know, I, I, I don't say this, I don't, I'm not trying to teach people to suck eggs here. I sat with a consultant psychiatrist once who told one of my patients while they were exploring their suicidal ideation, he held, his phone went off, he answered his phone and he did that to my patient. Um, and I was really angry and I, he, 
I, would, I actually afterwards told him he would never ever see another one of my patients again. So I, I will never ever, oh, bye Nina, I will never assume that everybody knows how to do this. So yes, so just asking the Socratic question, just asking those questions is not the best way. So I'm gonna ask Andrew to do that again. And, and, and what I'm gonna try and attempt to do is make it a little bit more conversational, um, a little bit more organic so that Andrew feels like he wants to explore stuff. Um, and so hopefully this, this is a little bit more reflective in its approach. So Andrew, again, thank you so much. Um, what was your experience of the pandemic like? Uh, my experience was that it was twofold. Um, again, on a like, personal and social level, um, it was quite difficult for me. Um, in terms of work, I actually found it much easier to work from home. Um, and again, had more time to reflect in that sense. Okay, so you said it was twofold. So I'm assuming the personal and the work is the twofold. And the it sounds like the work was slightly more manageable than the personal side how did the personal side in, in during that pandemic how did you feel about that I would say there was a mixture of feelings and that within itself was the problem I kept thinking I need to use the time I've got to explore a new skill or that I just need to take this time because I'm never going to get it again in a weird sort of completely way um, to progress mm. um, and I was failing at that so it sounds it it actually sounds like you were putting yourself under some thinking pressure to actually do something because there was time to kind of do something. Is that right? It, it, absolutely, it's the story of my life. I would say. <laughs> Why do you think it's the story of your life then? Um, it came to the point that when I was younger, I used to think quite a lot to my own detriment, um, okay. and it was. I always used to think I was different and a bit weird in that sense. Um, you know, I, I ended up studying philosophy um, to try and understand how to think. Um, and when you're by yourself in a pandemic, you have lots of time to do that. But because I'm all, quite naturally a, a negative thinker, obviously I kind of went down the rabbit hole there. Right, okay. So though that time the pandemic, um, allowed you to almost reconnect with understanding who you are prior to pandemic time, re-recognizing -re elements of yourself yeah. that actually then didn't were not working in the manner you wanted them to work for you within the pandemic, and like you said, could have sent you down a rabbit hole. Yeah, in, in fact, that's exactly what happened. Mm. Um, it was that realization that oh, hold on a second. Um, I've got so much time with myself that I never had before. Um, who am I? <laughs> and what am I doing here? I was wanting to go into become a lecturer initially, then it was uh, going into professional services as a student advisor. So once you actually have time to reflect in that sense, it, I was quite overwhelmed and surprised by the amount of things that had been happening in the background that I had no idea about. Right. That's really interesting. So, Andrew, before we carry, I'm going to stop there for a minute, just because yeah. actually I could quite happily carry on and talk to you all day. <laughs> and I'm very, very well. I've got four minutes, so I, I, I am not. Um, I'm trying not to be dismissive of you, so I do apologise that. So, so how did that sound to other people? Did that sound slightly nicer? Some of what we got in the chat bar. Plato's use of Socrates, investigating character dialogue. Yeah. Um, vision reminds me of non-violent communication, reminds me of training, training for the Samaritans, much nicer, a lot nicer. Yes, from the heart questions, natural coaching. Yeah, it's coaching. Yeah, much nicer, got more info, much more conversational, summary of feelings. Yeah, so in, in, in literally space of probably about two minutes, I, I was trying to show, nobody's perfect, I was trying to show some of these, you know, the paraphrasing, the clarifying, bringing things together and Andrew, did it feel better? Please tell me. Oh, yeah, yeah much better. <laughs> so, yeah, so in effect, that's what we're, I suppose that's what we're trying to do. And how, how that conversation goes and how it moves forward is going to be very dependent upon, obviously, the experiences that our students are reflecting on. So, you know, it doesn't, it doesn't always need to go in a very deep way. 
Um, but again, you know, that will depend on what they're reflecting on and what you, and also as the person guiding the reflection in somebody, how comfortable you feel. But I suppose what's really important, like I said, this is, it isn't therapy. We're not actually giving therapy to somebody. We're just allowing somebody to explore their experiences. Sometimes that will get, the what, so what now are, yes, yes, Sam, Samantha, sorry, I, I love the what, the so what now are, and actually, you know, Terry Borton's version of that, well, the original version by Terry Borton was created, wasn't it, for our um, for education after lesson planning. So I love the what, the so what, the now. And I actually think it's a really good model to write with, to reflectively write with for academic purpose, because it actually mimics intro, middle, end of a normal piece of academic work. So I think it's one of the easier ones to use. But again, I, I think if we don't understand reflection, not everybody will understand the what, the so, what, and the now, and what needs to go in each of those areas. Um, if anybody's interested, um, you, you know, I'm more than happy to check out my work email. I, um, um, I did actually create a model of reflection, a framework of reflection to support reflective writing for academic purposes, uh, which helps the student to reflect. Yeah, just drop me an email, helps the student to reflect um, and meet the requirements of academia. You know, so because um, I'd moaned about it for about 18 years and um, I thought better write one. So, yes. So, um, in fact, what I'll, I don't I don't quite know how I'll do this, but I'll somehow make sure that everybody knows where, where it is and I'll, I'll try and send it out to people. Um, so, so, yes, there's lots of models out there. And, and in there, to be fair, I think I, I, I mean, I, I trained as a reality therapist and I've done coaching and I've done all kinds of stuff as part of my, you know, when I when I, after I did my mental health nursing. But I suppose the nice thing about reflection is, is that you can flip between you know, that kind of, let's get into the experience, let's explore it, let's draw conclusions, let's go back to the experience. We don't have to stick to a set structure. And I do think that's important um, for us to remember. It's, it, it, it can be very fluid. And if, if, if a student just sits for an hour and just wants to talk about what they went through, do you know what, that's all right. Because, you know, they might need that. They might need that. Um, and so, I'm very aware of time. So just in that little snippet, I did just want to kind of just show you a little bit. So I'm hoping I've kind of covered everything. I'm hoping everybody kind of, we're all, you know, we're all going to go and be out an amazing reflective practitioners and we're going to employ it within our personal truth. Has anybody got any questions? Yes, Jean. Hi there. So I'm a senior tutor. So one of my roles is to train the, the 50 or 60 personal tutors that I oversee. Yeah. I would I, I've already tried to incorporate some reflective practice in what we get to try and get the students to fill in in terms of their, their, their portfolios and things when they yeah. go to their tutors. Um, and I'd love to improve that and, and you've given us some good tips. Um, my one concern is that obviously all my tutors aren't some of them are better better than others, shall we yeah. say. If I encourage the students to be um more reflective and open themselves up more and my tutors aren't capable of handling that in the right way am i put, making students more vulnerable i just have a um, concern in the back of my head uh, i would say yes and no i think in any personal tutoring um connection you're obviously always going to have a personal tutor who is really interested, who is more engaged or who is better equipped. Um, and you're always going to have those that aren't or don't want to be personal tutors and are doing it because they have to. You, I suppose we're always going to have that and we're always going to have. Um, th there'll always be. I don't think we need to get people to reflect to potentially hear things that are difficult. Um, I had a student where I was actually their dissertation supervisor, I wasn't their personal student. And she rang me one day and actually managed to email me a picture of a bruised arm and rang me while the ex-boyfriend is banging down the door to get into a house. And for some reason, she phoned me, not her personal tutor. And, and you know, and I had, I, I, I was just her supervisor, but she obviously felt some kind of connection to me that she, she wanted help on the phone. So um, I, I think, we may hear things anyway, whether we're doing it just to, as a quick catch up with a personal student who's suddenly having a bad time, they're going to fall apart on you. Um, I think we've got to have some, a little bit of confidence, I suppose, sometimes in our personal duties 
that if the tutee doesn't feel connected to their tutor, it's less like not unlikely it's less likely they'll start talking about things that they that are really sort of affecting them and I also think I suppose one thing I teach our staff is reflection shouldn't be we are not going to tell the student what they must reflect on some of our staff do they'll make them reflect on their clinical practice or they'll make them reflect on a, on a critical incident if we do that um, then obviously we're, we're sort of pushing them into a position of where we're telling them what experiences they need to reflect on. So I think as long what we need to do is 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 he, we can't we can't in we can't turn people into amazingly compassionate empathetic individuals. What we can do though, yes, sorry, Larissa, is give people um, um, the the skills, and I think as long as somebody's got the skill it's their job then to employ that skill to make sure that student is safe. It's our job to make sure the, the, the personal tutor has actually got the skill. And then if something pops up that's difficult, they know who to actually um, signpost the student to. Um, I don't know whether that's answered your question very well. Um, sorry, uh, yeah. Larissa, you, you've asked a question um, that I completely said I would answer later on. And, and I suppose, um, Jean, sorry, I'll come back to you in a minute if you if you if, if there's anything else. I do apologize. Um, reflective versus reflexive. This is an interesting one because those people who don't always understand reflection very well or being reflective often will think being reflexive is quite different. And I don't actually personally think it is. Um, I'll often use the word reflexive in the nature in relationship to research. Um, you know, uh, I supervise doctoral students and supervise them in there when I, I, I'm not a quant person I'm a qual person I wouldn't know how to, how to add up if you paid me um so you know in qualitative research it's really very important as the person is doing the research to understand how they are as a researcher influencing the research as it's occurring that's about being reflexive being reflexive really is reflection in action you are exploring who you are what you are and your influence on what's occurring at the time. So if we're being reflexive, it's the really kind of the same thing. It's just a different way of saying, I think personally being re reflecting in the moment. As a mental health nurse, I have to reflect in the moment because I, when I'm working with a patient or was working with patients, um, and especially my patients, because I worked in the field of addictions and they're very quick to judge. Um, if you don't understand yourself in that moment, how somebody is experiencing you, how you are experiencing them and actually, have fairly decent levels of emotional intelligence you, your patient walks out the door and doesn't come back so you're exploring yourself in the moment and you're adapting what you're doing how you're doing it to keep everything productive um being that is also classed as being reflexive so but they tend to use that term reflexive as it applies to you it, it being immersed as the researcher in your research um, so when I'm researching, they'll look for that reflexivity within the research when you're writing your thesis, which is really to explore how you as a researcher, your positionality, your ontology, your epistemology, how that's influencing yourself as a researcher, how you potentially influence your research. Um, but in a nutshell, you're reflecting on your experience of research and looking at how you're influencing it. I hope that's kind of answered your question. Sorry, Jean, before I cut you off horribly there was there something else you wanted to add i do apologize no no that was, it was useful it's it's just yeah it's one of those difficult ones isn't it of, of getting that balance between encouraging students and, and just having that slight nervousness that once we yeah. train the tutors the, the the not to engage ones are the ones that don't engage with the training yeah. either yeah and, and i suppose the other thing is is that um it's important, I think somebody mentioned in the chat earlier, it's about having boundaries as well. It's about very, being very clear on what your boundaries are. That, you know, if I'm employing, if I'm supporting you to reflect on your experiences, I'm not actually going to offer you counselling. It's, it's something that comes up that you feel you're going to need a, a, a much greater level of support and a much more structured way of exploring something. Then, you know, I know I'm, you know, I can signpost you to somebody. I know who I can help you to connect with if you feel that, you know, actually just exploring this in a reflective process is actually not what you need. So I suppose it's just making sure that as personal tutees, sorry, as personal tutors, we understand what reflection is. We know what our boundaries are um, and that actually when, you know, reflection doesn't always need to be done formally as well. You know, you can employ reflective dialogue in, in a very informal, organic, 
conversational way where the student doesn't even feel like they're coming in to reflect on an experience it's just when when my when I see my students I think because I do this all the time and because of mental health it's something that I should really be doing um I do it anyway quite naturally um and then if I need to be more directive I will often say to the student is it okay if I give you some advice um so at most conversations that my students will have with me from a personal tutor experience will tend to be fairly reflective in nature anyway, even if it's not an official reflective dialogue where am I where I'm officially. So I, it, it doesn't always need to, to be employed in a very sort of structured way. It could just be that what we're doing is, is giving our staff, our tutors, the skills to be able to have more open conversations where students are actually allowed to own a conversation a little bit and to explore what what they're experiencing um uh, are there any specific techniques we can employ to make students feel more comfortable in sharing issues um specific techniques um things like you know like my psychiatrist did don't actually phone halfway through a conversation that's really not nice um things like just being i don't know just allowing who you are to come through carl rogers um you know the guru of psychology i would have been he would have been my fourth husband if i'd met him years ago but he's unfortunately very dead um you know his core conditions of, of sort of congruence empath empathic regard and unconditional positive regard embodying those and embodying what it is to be person-centered which is you know I'm going to allow my authentic self to come through you know today who I am here in this webinar and you know Claire will probably attest to this because she's my boss actually is actually really not much different to who I am outside of here um, I am being my authentic self I may have slightly adapted my foul language at times because obviously we're in a very different professional environment but I'm trying to be my authentic self and you know people won't don't share stuff with people they're not comfortable with and people who aren't authentically who they are. So if you are, a gen, if, if inherently you are a fairly nice person, only you will know that, if you are a fairly compassionate person and if you allow your authentic self to come through, students will start to, they'll feel quite naturally a connection to you. If you act the role, you, you guys must know, you must have seen it. And if you haven't seen it, you must have experienced it yourself as a student at some point when you've been a student, somebody who acts the role of lecturer. I have seen people do it and it's like outside the door, they're totally different. And then they, they go into the lecture room and it's like they turn into like this thing. And I'm like, a bit like GPs. I, I've, you know, I know GPs outside of work. And when I see them at work, I'm like, oh, you're not like that outside of work. <laughs> it's like they act, you know, they, they take on the embodiment of what they think a GP is or what they think. I've, you know, I've seen it in mental health nursing. People act the role of a nurse. You can't connect with a cardboard cutout. You can only connect with somebody who's been their own authentic self with respect for the um, situation that they're actually in. So, yes, a, 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 a teaching staff or allowing staff or giving staff permission to allow who they are to come through and having confidence that, you know what, I'm actually an all right person. I'm a good person. So it's OK for me to let my personality come through. Um, then, then a student will connect with that. So a student might feel more comfortable sharing. Having boundaries, you know, you're not there to be their mate. You're there to be their person, to support them, to be the person to go to, to be the person who creates the safe space. You know, I know my students feel safe with me. I am very tight bound. I, I learned quickly in the field of addiction. If you do not have boundaries, you really are up the creek without a paddle. Um, so my patients knew there were my boundaries you can bounce between my boundaries but you don't go over my boundaries so we have flexibility within the boundaries but the boundaries are there so my patients felt very safe with me there was no messy and I took them. <laughs> um but I you know I had their backs I was there for them I was very um organic with them with boundaries um and I'm like that with my students um so I think you know getting to know who you are the more you can get to know yourself as a person um, and the more confident you feel with who you are, not arrogance, but, you know, a confidence about who you are as a person, that you're a good person, that you know what you're doing. People pick up on that. You know, um, we can't make students share. But all I can do is is try and provide a space that is a safe space, that they're safe with me, that they know that I can manage anything that they want to talk to me about. And if it's out of my scope of practice, they also know I'll be very honest with them. So um, I wouldn't say there's specific techniques, but I do think there's lots of attitude and evolvement that we can get to a point where we then feel much more happy with that. Um, I'm not sure if that answers your question, sorry. Um, anything else? 
or anybody wants to ask. I hope we've covered everything. Yes, I, I, I just, yeah. I, I don't think, you know, unless your authentic self is really not a good person, um, then yes, hide it. But no, as long, you know, allow yourself to come through. So I'm, I'm glad you guys have, have found it interesting anyway. Um, and um, I'm, I will work out how to share that um, article with you um, and uh, behind the scenes. And I'm, I'm sure Claire and, and uh, we can share it with you at some point. If you send us the article, we can, uh, we can forward it on, Nicola. Brilliant. Thanks, Claire. Thanks. Thank you, Nicola. That was a really interesting presentation with some engaging and reflective discussion, which I'm sure will be informative to our members.